make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so we have started to discuss this ENSO phenomenon. It's too much. So what's going on in the Pacific when there's ENSO going on? So we looked at this temperature distribution at the equator in the Pacific from the surface to, in this case, 500 meters, and then from the Western Pacific here to the Eastern Pacific. And we saw that there is this interesting stratification. And, and intuitively, it was also clear to us that because we have these trade winds, so we have the subtropical high pressure systems in both hemispheres sitting at around 30 to 40 north. And to the south of this, in the northern hemisphere, and to the north and the southern hemisphere, we have these trade winds that blow from the east to the west. And they push over the water uh, from the Eastern Pacific to the Western Pacific. And, 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 and at this boundary here, we have this problem that the water must come from somewhere. And one very effective possibility is that it is replaced by water from the from layers below, but the layers below are cold. So there is this tendency to get this cold. Uh, temperatures, particularly in this Eastern Pacific region, but also, as you can see, also in the Atlantic region, there's a similar phenomenon. Whereas in the Indian Ocean, where we have kind of a lack of really a very close boundary, then this, this is up, kind of absent. So this is a very interesting feature. And then, and then during El Nino, what is happening, as we discussed, this whole this whole system under tension breaks together. The whole Pacific is flushed with warm water and the convection adjusts and so on. Now we want to understand what is actually going on when this, uh, when this is happening. So here's another picture of the same El Nino event in 2015, 16, only for averaged, they are normally averaged for a longer period. So this is kind of a seasonal average and okay, it looks similar in principle. The, the magnitude are a little bit different. And then we see also already that there are in other ocean basins, there are some signals too. So we may want to explain what's going on in the other ocean basins while we have this El Nino phenomenon. And why, why we are interested in this we are interested in it in itself because it's an interesting phenomenon, but also because there are well-known Enso Tiller connections. So El Nino phenomena can, on the seasonal time scale, and Enso can happen in winter, but can also extend already start in summer, or maybe extend from the winter to the summer, and so can influence uh, also. Um, like the June to August period and not only it's most powerful in this period from let's say November to February maybe. And then as you can see in this schematic here, these are the very well established Taylor connections that can happen. So for example, if there's El Nino, of course it's, it's wet and warm in the Eastern Pacific. I mean, this is not a big surprise. We will discuss in more details why we expect this to happen. Uh, but clearly already we can imagine that the warm SSTs there um, make, make convection more likely to happen. And then that can lead to global teleconnections. For example, we find a warm Alaska in El Nino events. But El Nino is kind of, is a, is a kind of an oscillation. Also, there can be the opposite phase. And so when we have the cool phase, the cool uh, Enzo phase is kind of a, a strengthening of the mean state if we want to. It's a strengthening of this mean state situation. Actually, we didn't name it, but this, this, this feedback, we have a cold Eastern Pacific SSTs. Um, that will, okay, let's discuss this a little bit. The cold Eastern Pacific SSTs will, on the equator, also create a high pressure in this region because 
because that is, is uh, when we have cold air mass at the surface, we will have a, typically, due to the hydrostatic equation, a high pressure. And in the Western Pacific, we have a lower pressure. So that will further increase the easterly winds. So we can imagine that there's some positive feedback between the atmosphere and the ocean going on. The ocean is cool. That will influence the atmospheric pressure. The atmospheric pressure is in such a sense that this will enhance further the winds that cool the ocean and so on. So we call this feedback, Bjergnes feedback mechanism. It's a very well known mecha mechanism. And as we will see, the same Bjergnes feedback mechanism is actually also happening when there's an El Nino going on, only in an, in an anomalous sense. Um, yes, so we have all these tiller connections. And then in, in, the, in the boreal summer season, we find, for example, very well known drying over the, the Asian, South Asian region. So that's the that's a famous Enso monsoon relationship here. In Africa, there are some teleconnections also. I have to tell you that, you know, for example, in summer, Africa looks very much blank here, but that's not entirely the case. So there are some teleconnections that may be not strong enough to be named here, but they are probably more teleconnections that are discovered with time. As you can see, Europe is completely blank. So there's still a discussion in which sense ENSO may be impacting Europe. But that impact is maybe very nonlinear, dependent on exactly which month we are talking about. So on average, it seems it's not robust enough. This impact is not robust in, enough to be listed in this sketch here. So what is going on? Imagine we have this a warm patch somewhere. Let's imagine it's in this tropical Pacific region. We have warm surface temperature conditions that will warm also the, the near surface air temperature, obviously. What will this do to our atmosphere? As you know from your, remember from your atmospheric physics course, that will destabilize the atmosphere. So this warm, warm condition will destabilize the atmosphere and using the, the this equation that tells us the, how buoyancy forces may impact, uh, may accelerate the vertical wind. Now we are talking about small scale. We are not talking about the very large scale, but we are talking about convective scale. How does convection kind of feel if on a large scale we have this warm conditions? So our atmosphere will be more unstable and that means there will be parcels that are rising and sinking. We can, this is another sketch that should indicate this. So when we have this environment that is unstable, so the temperature is decreasing very quickly with height, but our parcel has this extent here, then when our parcel is rising, it will be warmer than it is environment and it will be accelerated further uh, in the vertical direction and so on. And parcel sink will also uh, continue to sink. So that's an unstable atmosphere. Now, as you well remember, for, you know, that, that, that mechanism works much better in a moist atmosphere we have, because we have this effect that we will discuss also now that in a moist atmosphere, the temperature change with height has to be much less unstable compared to a dry atmosphere. So it's much easier to get unstable conditions in a moist atmosphere because of the release of latent heat in a, in a saturated parcel. So the conditions that we have, let's have a look at an equation here. The conditions that uh, guarantee us this, this, that the mean atmosphere is unstable with respect to moist, to a moist parcel that is saturated, is this equation here. I believe you remember this from your atmospheric physics course, right? This, this M 
Vs is the saturation specific humidity. Sometimes you can also use as a very good, uh, very close relationship of this to the mixing ratio of water vapor. Uh, now, how do you call this? This is, in this case, is a specific humidity, but there's also another quantity that is the ratio of water, water vapor to dry, just to the dry air. I can, how do you call this? Anyway, this is the, in this case, is here the specific humidity. You can also see if the air is dry, so if there's no, um, you know, completely dry, then these additional terms drop out and you go back to our, the stability condition is then again, the dry adiabatic uh, temperature change with height that you named already many times. So this one Kelvin per uh, 100 meters or 10 per one kilometer. Now our parcel itself, if it's, if it's saturated, will obey also this rule, will exactly, let's, to a good approximation, obey this temperature change with height, our saturated parcel. And then of course, if our environment is unstable with respect to this moist ascent of our parcel, then there will be a buoyancy force and the parcels will rise and will sink. Now, why is this important? The sinking will not, may not have much effect in a, even in a saturated environment, the sinking parcels, they will just become not saturated anymore. But for the rising parcels, something interesting is going on. Because again, remember your <coughs> atmospheric physics course. Um, you can show that if you consider the relative humidity for a rising parcel, then that is always this re relative humidity tendency for a rising parcel is always positive. The reason is that you can express this in terms of water vapor, uh, again, um, um, a specific humidity, which can be assumed to be a conserved quantity for a rising parcel. But then there is a term that is directly proportional to the change of the saturation specific humidity. And this saturation specific humidity is a strong function of temperature. Therefore, when we go up, and we know from this equation here, that whenever we have rising motion, then the, the temperature of the parcel will decrease. That is what this equation tells us. There can be, the, the sign is all positive here. So the temperature has to decrease if we have a quickly rising parcel. So that means that for this parcel, this saturation specific humidity will always uh, uh, decrease. So this term is positive. So the relative humidity will go up. And at some point for the rising parcels, there will be condensation and rainfall is, 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 is happening. Rain is falling out and there's heating, condensational heating due to this convection events. Um, what is that? Yeah, sketch. So that, to highlight this, I have just put this uh, an idealized sketch for what is happening if you have lifting at a mountain. So if, if air tries to flow over a mountain, in some sense, this is also happening. So you lift a parcel if the parcels are moist enough, at some point uh, they will be saturated and condensation will occur and rain is falling out. And then on the other side of the mountain, you have just the sinking motion and, and, and very dry conditions. So the, the, what is happening in each of these convective cells where we have a rising parcel, similar things can happen in this more large scale situation where we have the, the, the rising is then forced on a mountain region. Now, so that means that in this region, in this Eastern Pacific region, where we have, let's say, our El Nino large spot, where normally there's not much rain, under normal condition, there's not much rain. But this, this making the air more insta uh, instable means that there are some parcels that are rising quickly, and they release a lot of uh, heat, 
and there's a lot of rain falling out. Actually, the rain falling out can be taken as an exact uh, proportional measure for the heating that is going on in that region. So we are asking now the question, so that would be kind of the micro scale effect of, our, of this warm temperature perturbation on the, on the micro situation here or, or small scale situation. We get a more unstable atmosphere and therefore there's more mixing and therefore there's more convective heating because there will be always parcels that are rising and then condensation and the rain is falling out. Whereas the sinking is, is a little bit asymmetric in this sense. You, you, we cannot, we cannot um, kind of have the opposite effect for, for sinking parcels. So we get on average increased convective heating in this region here. Now, in order to understand the last the large scale adjustment that that can cause, let's go back to our thermodynamic equation. I, I wrote here, we can go back to equation 47. Because in the tropics, we are kind of lucky. In, this, in the tropics, we have a very, very simple equilibrium based on the fact that temperature, horizontal temperature changes and time temperature changes in time are small compared to temperature changes in the vertical direction in other terms. So we may ignore this term, all the terms here, the horizontal advection terms and the local temperature change. And then there's a very good equilibrium between the heating and the diabatic cooling combined with the vertical advection that is going on here. So, so putting it simply, we have this heating due to the increased convective activity, but this heating has to be, you know, otherwise the, the, the air would be warm up indefinitely. So there has to be some compensating mechanism that cools off the atmosphere. It cannot always be heating. There must be some equilibrium at some point. It turns out that the horizontal advection terms, they are not very effective, but this vertical advection term together with the diabetic cooling is a very effective compensating term. So we get to a first approximation, we get this equilibrium between the diabatic heating term and the adiabatic cooling term, if we want to call it this way. Which is now um, in this equation here. And then, okay, that would be this equilibrium here. So this is just a diagnostic equation. That doesn't tell us, and we will make use of this possibility later on. This tells us that sometimes the heating may lead to a vertical velocity, but sometimes the vertical velocity may lead to a heating. This equation doesn't give us any cause and effect. It's just a approximate equilibrium between these two terms. It's actually a very good, you know, this equation is in the tropics, maybe even in many cases in the extra tropics. It's often a very useful approximation to understand vertical motions that may compensate for heating events. So if we make now the approximation that the omega is the, you remember, is the total, is the pressure derivative, dp by dt. And also here again in the tropics, the main term may be this w dp by dz. So the horizontal, again, the horizontal derivatives may be small. And so only this vertical term is large. It is indeed much larger than the other terms. If we insert the hydrostatic equation again, we get that the same equilibrium that we have derived is also valid for the, vert for the physical vertical motion, for the real vertical motion. So W is also approximately balanced by the heating. And then there are, is the stability parameter, density, acceleration due to gravity and the CP. Now, uh, so that would be valid for any mean vertical motion and any mean heating, but it is also to a good approximation valid for perturbations, because often perturbations in the density are considered to be quite small 
at least if we are you know, at some basic level of the atmosphere. And also perturbations of the stability may be relatively small, particularly if we are in a, in a moist atmosphere where we are, it turns out we are always very close to the moist idea, but it can be changing a little bit the stability, of course, if we have a large scale unstable environment, but we are bound to be very close to the moist idea, but. So, so also this equation may also apply to perturbations. So whenever we have a vertical velocity perturbation, that should be compensated by a large scale heating anomaly or vice versa. In particular, this is the case for our El Nino event. We have this large scale heating perturbation during El Nino events, and that must be compensated by a perturbation in the vertical velocity. There's a sketch again that should be highlighting this effect. So imagine now again, we are now in the Eastern Pacific here. We have these warm sea surface temperature conditions that make the atmosphere more unstable. Then we have argued, we need to have this increase of convective heating on average. So there are more clouds and more convective rainfall. Now, that has to be compensated in these tropical regions by a increase of the vertical velocity. So they are compensating. So we have rising motion. That means also at the surface, we get some kind of, we have to get some kind of convergence. And in upper level, we have to get a, a divergence. Why? Because once the, the flow hits the tropopause, something interesting is going on because the stratosphere behaves really very different from the troposphere. In the stratosphere, now suddenly the stability parameter becomes very, very large. A large stability means that even if we have a heating perturbation in the stratosphere, which may be anyway small, but even if there is, then given that the stability is so large, the vertical velocity perturbations will be extremely small. So the the tropopause, the tropopause acts some kind of like a lid to our flow because of this strongly increasing stability. And that means for continuity that at this upper level here, we have, if we have positive vertical motion, that has to be compensated by divergence. The, the air has to go somewhere since it, it's, it cannot very effectively intersect the, the, the tropopause because the stability is so large, there will be a strong divergence in these upper levels. Now, we can immediately now think that this upper level divergence may be very interesting for us because think about Rossby waves. If we think about our Rossby waves, this equation here. This is the vorticity equation. Then we have, we have derived Rossby waves. We don't need this term here. We don't need the divergence term because Rossby waves, they, they may just propagate without increasing their amplitude as we have shown by, uh, by just using the conservation of absolute vorticity. But if there is this term that is relevant for pyroclinic instability, but may be also induced by tropical convection, then this term can generate Rossby waves. This can be a source for Rossby waves. So this injects energy into the Rossby wave that then may propagate into the extratropics in our case and within the tropics, because we have our, we also know we, uh, that we have our um, equatorial waves anyway, the, the Rossby waves and the Kelvin waves and so on. But this also generates an extra tropical Rossby wave train, which will be, uh, we see also. So that, that is essentially what's going on when we have an El Nino phenomenon happening in the Pacific. We get more instability, increased convective rainfall, 
vertical motion that has compensated the has to compensate the increased convective rainfall that sets in motions and these motions are already immediately related to upper level divergence and that can generate if we are a little bit away from the equator already that can generate a rossby wave but that also generates tropical waves that propagate the signal all over the place this is again shown here a little bit um, in another sketch. So if we have our warm patch in the Eastern Pacific, that will generate more convection. There will be vertical motion and that generates equatorial Rossby and Kelvin waves. And somewhere the air has to sink, of, of course, and that, that can influence then the, the climate in different regions. But we have also seen now, um, we are looking at, um, less um, idealized picture. This is now an average picture, a composite for averaging many, many, many El Nino events in, in, this is now for boreal winter DJF. So this is not just taking one ENSO event, but we do a composite of many El Nino events. So we look for years when we have El Ninos and to make a composite. And it's even linear. So we take also La Ninas, the opposite sign, multiply them by minus one and also take them into account. So this would be the, this is kind of the average typical picture of a El Nino sea surface temperature perturbation. And as you can see, okay, this is what we expect to get this warm Eastern Pacific. But you see, can see that there are some interesting structures. We get this cooling pattern around this warming pattern in the extra tropical North and South Pacific. So we also call this typical pattern, it's called horseshoe pattern because it has a kind of the shape of a horseshoe. So we get this cooling. And we will try to explain this a little bit. And then there can be warming in other ocean basins. So something very well known is this warming, for example, in the Indian Ocean. Now this lower panel here shows us the same composite, but not for surface, sea surface temperatures, but for rainfall and low level winds. So the, 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 sh the sh color shading here is for the rainfall perturbation. And as we, as we discussed, we expect in this Eastern Pacific part where we have this warming, we expect to get increased convective rainfall on average. And this is, this is measured here. So that this, this increased convective rainfall is of course proportional to the heating that we have in the atmospheric column. But then there are also regions where we have decreased heating because in the Western Pacific, we have less convection than we usually have. And that's consistent with the fact that we have the cold anomaly here. But then do you see this here, this feature in this Aleutian low region, we get a strong cyclonic motion there. And do you remember that there was a warm anomaly in Alaska during El Nino events as one of the tiller connections? So this, this perturbation here could explain the warm anomaly in Alaska because we, if we have southerly winds in that region, we will certainly advect warm air there. But with this, we can also try to explain why we have this cold anomaly here. Can you make a guess? Does someone have a guess? It's related to the winds that we see. So on average in this region here, we have discussed the subtropical highs there around 30 north. So to the north of this, so from 40 to 50, we are already in the region with the average westerly winds. And so those westerly winds, they are increased. And if the winds, the wind speed is increased, then we have more surface evaporation in the North Pacific. And the surface evaporation that is latent heat flux, right? So that will cool off the surface. And therefore we get this, this cool anomaly in the North Pacific that is still connected to, the, to an El Nino event. So there, there can be very simple and nice explanations for what we find. What is very important for our discussion now 
is this wind response very close to the equator that goes into this heating and into the warmer normally. So these westerly winds that are induced, let's say, by the heat, by the atmospheric response to ENSO are a very crucial part for this positive feedback mechanism between ocean and atmosphere that is occurring during El Nino events and La Nina events. Just one more um, curiosity, because if you compare these two figures here, the sea surface temperature perturbation and the rainfall perturbation, we have the impression that the sea surface temperature perturbation is further to the east, whereas the rainfall perturbation is a little bit further extending to the west. Do you see this? The maximum is actually almost in the central Pacific here, whereas the maximum surface temperature perturbation is more to the east. Now, also here, we may provide an explanation because the mean stage is such that the Eastern Pacific is very, very, very cold. So maybe even is very stable on average. So maybe even if we have this warm anomaly here, we are not able to trigger efficiently convection because the atmosphere is still slightly stable, depending on the, on the strength of the ENSO event, of course. But maybe in the more central parts of the Pacific where the, the conditions are not that stable, it's easier, even with the smaller temperature perturbations to create more instability. So it's, that's a typical thing that we, it's easier to create instability here where the sea surface temperatures are already a little bit warmer. Now we want to know the crucial thing that we want to further investigate are these westerly winds that we see here on the equator that go in line with the El Nino event. We want to discuss how they come about. Okay, in order to do this, this is very short because we won't do many calculations here. We just look at the solution. We are going back to the same equations that we have used to derive our equatorial waves. This is the set of equation that we have used to derive our equatorial waves that contain equatorial Rossby waves, Kelvin wave, mixed gravity Rossby waves, and so on. But, and this Gill had this idea in the 1980s, uh, well, we want to understand, what we want to understand is the atmospheric response really to, a, to this heating that we have seen that is happening during El Nino events. And so the trick that he's using it, he wants to use the same simple equations that can be used to, to derive the, the, the waves, the equatorial waves. But you want to impose this effect of a heating. So what he did in that paper, and that is justified later on better how this is, how we can understand this, is that he inserted some kind of heating parameterization in the continuity equation. This is, of course, if you just take these equations as they are, completely unphysical. Because, because this equation here is not the thermodynamic equation. This is the continuity equation. So you would add some mass or something like this. So this, this is a little bit unphysical. Even more so if you think about it. So if we look at our picture, it's done here. What happens in reality is if we have this warm patch, we have the heating, we get vertical motion, okay. This heating is just positive in the Eastern Pacific where we have the warm patch. But at the surface, we expect to get low level convergence. Whereas in upper levels, because the flow hits the tropopause, we get divergence. 
So it's clear that the, that this, that the, that the divergence has to change sign as we go from lower levels to upper levels in this condition. However, in this simple parametrization that Gill has used, there's no way we can realize this. Because if we go back to that equation, here in a stationary state, let's assume we have a stationary state, then if the heating has one sign, then the divergence will have one sign. So we cannot mimic this effect that the divergence actually changes from the lower to the upper levels. So the trick that they use is they change the sign of Q between lower and upper levels to mimic this effect of this vertical. So it's a little bit cheating, but it is, it is then justified in that paper and in, in, in other papers why this may still be a, a good way to, to, to understand what is going on. But in, in principle, to mimic this, then we have to, this Q has to change sign between lower and upper levels, because otherwise we cannot have at low levels um, divergence or convergence and at upper levels divergence if we have the same sign of Q, we have to change the sign of the Q. So let's say the idea is to have this forcing term in this equation that leads to divergence that can then be a source for our equatorial waves also. Now, if you go into the paper, he solves this equation very elegantly, analytically. But that is very, very, very complicated. So if you are interested, please go into the paper and, 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 and find the analytic solution. It's very, very interesting. What he has to do is he has to insert a damping term. So essentially, re he replaces always d by dt by d by dt plus epsilon, where epsilon is the parameter for some Rayleigh friction terms on the right hand side of this equation. So he has to, since he has a source, he has introduced a source for energy, he has to have some kind of damping term. And we will just look at the solutions that he finds that are consistent with what we have seen already in principle. The solutions are quite interesting. So this would be a looking on the equator. So here's the equator, here's north, he is east-west, and the heating is up exactly here in the, uh, at this point here. And what he gets is that he gets a stationary, he looks for stationary solutions because he has a forcing and damping. And, and so he can find a stationary solution. So the waves that are propagating, we don't see them anymore, but we see the equilibrated state. But it's interesting to see that this that the eastern part here of the solution seems to be governed by that something that is very much resembling a Kelvin wave. Because if you if maybe you can blow this up a little bit, the winds that as they should they blow into this heating region, but there there's almost no original wind component. So that, that is very similar to the Kelvin wave. And then, then the amplitude here that we can see in terms of this is now uh, height or pressure is, is decaying away from the equator. So, so we have our exponentially uh, decay away from the equator. So we may interpret this side of the solution as governed by the Kelvin waves. And also note, this will be important later on, not today, but in later lectures, that even though, so there is a shear of the zonal wind, it's maximum on the equator, and then it decays as we go to the north and to the south. There's no original wind on this side. So this shear of a zonal wind is, what is, is related also to vorticity, which, there seems to be no rotation here, but still the, the shear is proportional to, to something that is, 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 is defined as vorticity. Just keep this in mind. And then, but on the, 
Western side of our solution, we find this, what is interpreted then as Rossby gyres. So off the equator, we find this cyclonic structures. And so in particularly what he finds is that in the heating region itself and just to the west of it, we get this very strong westerly wind perturbations. So that would be, that would be his theoretical explanation of what we see, what we have seen in this picture here. So we get on the equator, this very strong westerly winds that should provide the positive feedback to the ENSO phenomenon. We, we, this is what we want to discuss next. So now we have shown what is the, using GILS, this GIL model that is based on the equatorial waves, what is the expected surface wind response? Or we can just take this picture and say, yes, we see the atmospheric response are these westerly winds. But we want to understand, you know, remember we have imposed a warm surface temperature perturbation. We want to understand now, given this surface temperature response, what is the response in the ocean? What is happening in the ocean? Does this provide a positive or a negative feedback in the ocean? So in order to do that, we have obviously to look into the ocean. We have to look into the ocean and we have to, to, to try to, to model this system here, essentially. Here, this, this was our picture on the equator in the Pacific Ocean from the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific. So somehow we have to try to model this picture here, this thing here. Now, Physicists always try to make things as simple as possible because reality is very complicated. So one way to tackle this in order to, to understand a little bit better what's going on is we say, okay, this picture is complicated, but let's make the following assumption. It looks like there's warm water here on top of cold water here. And in between we have this, we named this already, we have something that is called thermocline, which represents this very strong gradient between the cold water down and the warm water up. So the simplification of this situation is, we say, okay, let's assume there's just one temperature down here and one temperature up here, and then there is a limit line, which is the thermocline. So we simplify, we take again our hammer and say, okay, let's keep it very simple. And of course, these two temperatures, they, they will induce two different densities. So the, of course, the, the, the colder water has a larger density than the warmer water. There's a small change, as we will see later, but still there is a small change in density because we know that cold water, water of four degrees has the largest density. And then, so this is our setting in principle. And and we are interested essentially only because later on in our derivation, we will say this lower, this lower layer will be considered as inert. That is just not moving. It's just standing there. But our, all our motions are supposed to be in this upper layer above the thermocline. So, and so we want to understand what is our pressure gradient in this upper layer that, that should induce motions in this upper layer that are probably, as we hope, induced by our surface winds that are created by ENSO. So we want to understand what these surface winds do to our pressure gradient in this upper layer. So we, so keep in mind this picture here. The total depths here We will call that H. 
that is the sum of H1 and H2. So that is the total depths here. And so the trick is again, something similar to what we have used again before. We start our integration of the hydrostatic equation in order to write this horizontal pressure gradient in the upper layer. We start our complex integration at some arbitrary point in this lower layer here. And then we integrate up first until this limit line. Then we, we, we make use of properties at this limit, namely continuity of our variables. And then we integrate from this to an arbitrary point here at which we want to assess our pressure gradient. So that's the trick to derive these equations that are valid. So we perform this integration from this lower, some point in the lower layer to the, to the top of this lower layer, which is the thermocline. And of course, here we have the, the pressure is P2 and the density is, is this larger density rho two. <clears throat> and we can integrate the hydrostatic equation as we know, because <clears throat> within the layer itself, the density is constant. And we apply uh, the horizontal gradient now to this. So we get to, to, to this equation here. Then we integrate further. Now we are at the line, we integrate further now in the top layer. But in the top layer, we have the density, the smaller density rho one and the pressure is P one. And so we can integrate also in this, in this upper layer from the boundary again, from this lower limit to some arbitrary Z, arbitrary height. And then again, we apply the horizontal gradient here. And now comes the continuity. We assume that at the, at the border between the two layers here, the pressure is the same. So we do this. And then we get to this expression here. If we do this, we get to this expression here, where we have also made use of the approximation that the total height, which is the height of the lower layer and plus the height of the top layer is constant. That is not the case actually, because we, in principle, we have a free surface, but it turns out if you take it, if you look at measurements, the variations of our surface in the Pacific, for example, are in the order of meters probably. I mean, surface variation, height, surface height variations are obviously there, but they're in terms of meters, a magnitude of meters maximum. Whereas our thermocline perturbations are in the order of hundreds of 100 meter. So we can, so this is a quite a good assumption that this is approximately, the total height is approximately constant, even though there are small variations of the total height of this of the system, because it's a, there's no rigid lid on top of our Pacific. And if we do this, we can simply work out what is our pressure gradient force in the top layer. And we get this exciting result that this is just again like the, is the, can be expressed as the gradient of our thermocline. No, not the top, not the gradient of, of our flow at the top, like we had in the shallow water model, but the gradient, the horizontal gradient of our thermocline. So the, the thermocline tilt, it becomes important here, how it, how it behaves in the X and in the Y direction. But instead of multiplying this just by the, by one as it would be in the normal shallow water model. What appears here is the density change between the two layers, the relative density change between the two layers. Of course, if the density in, in one layer is, is zero, then this goes back to the, our old con, uh, consideration, but 
So it turns out now we have to insert some value. The value that is typically used for, this, for the temperature changes that we have in the Pacific is that this relative density change is about 1%. We will just use this as a, as a constant. And then, and then you call this G primed, which is this density, relative density perturbation uh, multiplied by G. This is called reduced gravity. And if you use this, then our set of equations that is valid for our shallow water model in this upper layer of our thermocline looks exactly like our shallow water equations, only that we have re replaced the height gradient is now the, 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 the change of the thermocline tilt. And the G that we have to use is the G primed, which is the reduced gravity. Otherwise, these equations look formally exactly like our, like the shallow water equations that we have used already. And what what we have to do in this, um, we will now look at a numerical model simulation is of course, we again, we, we could study the free waves, but we are interested in what's, what's the response of our ocean to a wind stress forcing. Now we insert a wind stress. So tau is the wind stress. This is a parameterization of the wind stress at the top of the layer. We want to see how does our ocean uh, react to a wind stress forcing. That is now the forcing here, whereas the, the forcing in the atmosphere was the heating, but the forcing in the ocean is the wind stress that our, our atmospheric induced responses may provide to the ocean. Before looking at the El Nino case, we will, we will study what is happening in these equations if we look for the stationary solution with zero flow. In this case, the solution would be that the thermocline tilt has to be balanced by the wind stress at the surface. And this, it turns out that this is an approximation also for cases where we have flow in the ocean. So it turns out that with this equation, you can very nicely, and this will be, you will be doing in an exercise, you can very nicely explain why the thermocline, when there is a mean wind from the east to the west, why the thermocline has to tilt in the Pacific. And the amount that you can calculate is about the correct one if you insert a wind stress that is about the measured one that we uh, can observe. So these equations are quite powerful to understand already why our mean thermocline, given that we have mean easterly winds, has to be tilted. Now, in order to go further, what we do is, you don't have to worry about this, but someone has, has programmed these equations in a model for the ocean. And this model is, is called reduced gravity model because uh, we have just this, uh, this is essentially one layer of the ocean, which is representative of the thermocline. And so someone has, someone has programmed this. And I've used this model in order to understand what is the response in this model to a forcing. Maybe someone who is very clever could try to solve this analytically. But the, the, the path I've chosen is uh, I've taken this code that was already there, have inserted, have done two runs. You need always to do two runs. One run without any perturbations and one run where you impose the perturbation and then you look at the difference. So the perturbations that were imposed is, the one, is this one here that should mimic, so it's a positive wind stress. So this should mimic our, this westerly winds that are induced by the atmospheric response to a warm El Nino type anomaly. That is what we have seen, right? Our this wind response. So we parameterize the central Pacific wind response. So this is imposed in the model. We want to understand how the ocean is reacting to this. 
And the nice thing about the ocean is <laughs> for practical reasons that you can, whereas in the atmosphere you would have to, to look for responses, you would have to look at daily and sub daily data because uh, the responses would be so quick. But for the ocean, the ocean is slow. So you can look at monthly data. So if, if we do this, we look now at the ocean response to this zonal forcing. What does the ocean do? After one month, we see this quite beautiful picture here. So this again looks like our gill stationary response. It's not stationary, but it looks like we get an equatorial Kelvin wave here and this Rossby gyres off the equator to the west of the forcing. So we get exactly what the what Gill kind of has using a different system, but what he has kind of found. But then this is not stationary. So things are amplifying after two months. These waves start to propagate the, the whole Pacific and the, the Rossby waves here, this Rossby wave gyre propagates also in the opposite direction. So these are the waves. These are our off equatorial Rossby waves and our equatorial K wing waves that are permanently generated by this wind stress. And then after four months, actually the K wing waves, they hit the coast of Americas and turn into um, coastal K wing waves. So they, they propagate around the along the coasts. And probably the maximum response, think about it, we have this, this the, the, the forcing is a permanent forcing. We don't turn it off. It's turned on at day zero, but then it's permanently kept. And the maximum response we get at about six months. So this gives us already some time scale, some typical time scale for ENSO, for an ENSO response, what's going on during an ENSO. And then there seems to be some negative feedbacks. We will discuss this also later. So there's some decay of the strengths of the response. So if we look at now at this strong response, so what does it tell us? This red means that the thermocline has become deeper and the blue and the violet means that the thermocline is shallower. So our thermocline that was tilted has become less tilted. Intuitively now, it's immediately clear if that's the case. Uh, without that we, you know, uh, if we can show that that is the case, our thermocline becomes less tilted, then there will be a cooling in the, no, sorry, less tilted. There will be a warming in the Eastern Pacific and a cooling in the Western Pacific because the thermocline is less tilted. Now, the problem is within our, within our reduced gravity model, we cannot really model this unless, unless this, the thermocline really gets to the surface. But otherwise the temperature in the top layer is parameterized to be always the same. So what, what these models do is they parameterize a temperature, a surface temperature, which is on top of these equations which is not really part of this reduced gravity model, but is a parameterization, let's say, of surface temperature that make use of the real temperature distribution. And so such a model for this temperature would say, okay, the temperature at the surface is, is proportional to vertical velocity that comes into play, a temperature change between the surface and the thermocline. And the change of the depths of the thermocline. So whenever we have a change of the depths of the thermocline, given a vertical motion, that should induce in this model a, temp a surface temperature change. And then there are surface fluxes too. So if such an equation is used also, and then the response of course is what we have expected intuitively that where the thermocline this is now temperature, sea surface temperature. Where the thermocline becomes flatter, then we get a warming. 
and, 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 and this seems to peak actually only after one year, whereas the thermocline itself peaked at after six months. Now think about it. We had an initial warm anomaly in the Eastern Pacific. That has created an atmospheric westerly wind response. An atmospheric wind response here in the Central Pacific. That re wind response has influenced not only where the wind is, but the whole Pacific has changed the thermocline depths in such a way that the thermocline becomes flatter and it warms up more. So we have created a positive feedback. We started with a warm anomaly in the ocean. That has created an atmospheric feedback, these westerly winds that have reinforced step by step in this case, the warm anomaly that we initially had. So this is the same Biagnes feedback that we have been talking before that is valid in the mean state is also valid in this anomalous state. Just another consideration, if we look in now at this stationary state here, it's again interesting that we have this a strong thermocline tilt only where we have applied our wind stress. And then the situation is almost constant to the west and to the east. So again, our approximate um, equation for zero flow, which was here, is again very well valid. So we have a thermocline tilt only where we have locally where we have the wind stress applied. But otherwise the thermocline is, you know, if, if, if the wind stress then is zero, then the thermocline is relatively constant, which is the case. So this is also a good approximation even to this finer stationary state of this equation, of this solution to this perturbation. So now we have shown that Given an initial warm anomaly, the atmospheric response is such that this warm anomaly would be reinforced. So we have shown that there's an atmospheric ocean positive feedback loop. Now again, of course that cannot work indefinitely because otherwise the SSTs would always warm up and we get always stronger westerly winds and at some point we would have boiling, a boiling Pacific or something like this. So that is not realistic, of course. So there will be negative feedback mechanisms, right? There can be many negative feedback mechanisms. One is just that at some point the flow becomes so strong that we get frictional, um, frictional dissipation. But that is, that is there probably, but that, uh, that is maybe not so relevant because the other thing that we want that we had in mind already is that El, El Nino, El Nino Southern Oscillation, if it is supposed to be an oscillation, then this negative feedback should lead actually to the opposite phase. So it should not just be a damping, but we should have some feedback mechanisms that lead to, to a change of the sign. So there have been several theories have been proposed. One I think we can see here already, which is called the delayed oscillator mechanism. Because, because what we see is that the response is actually in, th in terms of thermocline maximum after about six months, then the response becomes weaker. It's still there because we have always the same forcing, but there's a negative feedback here uh, clearly. And the theory goes that, um, that the waves that are reaching this border here, they are reflected to become, these Rossby waves become equatorial Kelvin waves. And now they are cooling. Once they are reflected, they remain cooling. They cool the surface. They are so-called downwelling Kelvin waves instead of these upwelling Kelvin waves. Sorry, they are upwelling instead of these downwelling. And so they tend to cool the, the equatorial Eastern Pacific after some time. And now that of course would, if that's going to happen, if there's a cooling tendency then everywhere that would influence the winds and so on, which is something we have not 
uh, included here because our forcing is always constant. So that feedback is not included here. But that would be that that hypothesis that this for this equatorial delayed feedback from the waves that are reflected, that is called delayed oscillator mechanism for ENSO. So this delayed oscillator mechanism using a very simple set of equations can explain that there is a self-sustained oscillation in the equatorial Pacific based on this delayed negative feedback from the waves that are reflected. There are, there are also other um, mechanisms that have been proposed that are more in line with the, with the original propagation of the energy in these waves, which is also something that we perhaps see. So initially, the signal is very much localized on the equator, but later on, the energy is kind of distributed further to the north and to the south in the original direction. So this is another hypothesis that as the energy is discharged, then this also the feedbacks at the equator become weaker and there may be some overshooting. So once this discharge has, has started, there's an overshooting at the equator, it becomes maybe slightly cool. And that sets in again uh, the opposite Bjergnes feedback mechanisms. Uh, the equator becomes cold and then you, we get the La Nina event going on. So this other mechanism that talks about this original uh, effects is called recharge discharge mechanism for ENSO. That can also explain why there is a period of about, uh, so ENSO has a period of about four to seven years and both mechanisms are able to explain these periods. But this is still even is quite established now, but still probably some ongoing um, research also in that direction. What, what is the exact mechanism for ENSO? Is it, a, is it really a, a self-sustained oscillation? Does it, it doesn't need any external forcing or perhaps do we need, is it a stable oscillation and we need some external forcing from other oceans or from just from the atmosphere, some noise from the atmosphere is needed. Uh, there are still some open questions related to this. Yes, so um, there's a very useful exercise that I want you to do, which is this one here. So we we apply a wind stress, a mean wind stress in the Pacific and want to understand what kind of thermocline tilt that can explain or across the Pacific. And then, okay, this second exercise is absolutely trivial. You, uh, the carrying wave speed for the ocean with the uh, using the reduced gravity model. So you can just calculate that. Okay, so I, th so I think the schedule should be that we are seeing each other on Wednesday because the Monday lesson has been canceled. So we see each other on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday next week. But first, first concentrate on Wednesday. I think that maybe Thursday is not yet confirmed, but more or less like this, okay? All right, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.